Well, good morning. I'm Jeff Coleman. And I'm Deborah Pinkerton. Welcome to Morning Light. In just a minute, our Morning Light panel will go behind the headlines. But first, here's a preview of what's coming up a little bit later in the show. It's one of the most successful crowdfunded entertainment projects ever. We're talking about The Chosen, which follows the life of Jesus. We talked to one of the stars about season five. But it is Tuesday, September 17th. Within minutes of the latest attempted assassination of former President Donald Trump, Americans by the millions took to social media, assigning blame and motive to the alleged shooter, speculating, accusing one side or the other of causing the botched attempt. So exactly what is helpful in situations like these? What's the difference between old-fashioned gossip and being a good, engaged citizen? Well, I know that gossip is never good. Never good. Never good. Yeah, and especially and in situations like this right, can add fuel. That's right. You yeah. definitely, you just want the facts, the, right. real, the real figures. So in the meantime, it may take more than a Taylor Swift endorsement to get young voters to the polls. A circle analysis from Tufts University shows a steep decline in voter registration of 18 to 29 year olds in 36 states. That's compared to the same period in 2020. Pennsylvania saw a 17% drop from the last election. What is driving the decline and why are younger voters less engaged when the stakes are so high? It's a pretty steep drop off too from the last election. It yeah. is. And Pope Francis told an audience at an interfaith youth event in Singapore that all religious paths lead to God. Sikh, Muslim, Hindu, Christian, there are different paths. But as the Pope was building a framework for dialogue, did it somehow undercut the claims, the exclusive claims of Christianity? Is there a way for Christians to hold to convictions and truth while finding common ground on major public policy issues? That's a tough question. How do you strike that right balance? We'll take these questions to the Morning Light panel this morning. Senator Greg Rothman, thank you for coming back this morning. morning. It's an honor to have you all week. Tannen Herman, Wild Heart Ministries, great to have you here. And a surprise, Dave Beiser, thank you for being here this morning. Uh, our, our pastor, John Hayward, uh, had some church business to attend to. He'll be back uh, tomorrow. Uh, the rumor weed, if you grew up as I did as a generation on Veggie Tales, you know this wonderful character of the rumor weed who goes around spreading rumors. It was my daughter Anna's favorite Veggie Tale character. What's the problem, or what's the difference, I guess, Tannen, with uh, gossip? In the old sense, you think of you know maybe old ladies by the telephone with the cigarette, kind of hanging out watching the soap <laughs> operas, right? That's the old version of gossip. In the sophisticated <clears throat> gossip online, I've got some good information for you. You need to see this. I've got to forward it to you. Did you see? What's what's the what's going on here in this moment? Well, I'm I'm sure we're probably all familiar with the conversation that we entered into an age of information, and now I think we've moved into an age of misinformation, and mm. that's like the normal, I feel like. And, you know, as a, as a believer, I think it's really hard to suspend conversations that are only around truth because opinion is just rampant everywhere. Right. It's, it's easy to find. So it's important, I think, that we just always maintain a posture of humility of, okay, thanks for sharing what you heard, but I'm going to take it, you know, not at face value. I'm going to allow myself to go and find out what's going on. And I think that across the board, all the issues that we experience in life today are just people just don't know what the truth is. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. maybe are too quick to agree with yeah. what that truth is because it, you know, confirm something that they already, you know, were suspicious of or, or whatnot. But it just takes time to slow down. Right. I think the truth doesn't move as Take fast as we think it does, you know. We yeah, just gotta, right. Yeah, pair back. So, Greg, you're, uh, you're in politics. And so rumors are all, have been a part of your life. Uh, when yeah. you drive down the street and you're in the grocery, did you see Greg Rothman? You know what he was buying there? He wasn't getting low-fat yogurt, you know. <laughs> but so how do, you, how do you look at rumors and why is it so dangerous? Well, I, I, I subscribe to Satchel Page, who said, I believe, none are what I hear and half of what I see. Mm. Uh, look, it's about benefit of the doubt, right? I mean, you've got to give people the benefit of the doubt. You, you can't go to that negative, go to that worst case scenario. I mean, there's, there's plenty of situations like that. But it's about finding the truth, but it's also about how to, where, where, is, where is my heart? Right. And so, so if I look at my neighbor and say, Explain I love that. you. When you say heart well it's what do you the, mean? The, the vision you have I mean, what, what uh -huh. glasses do you look through do, do i look look at my fellow man and think the best or the worst mm. and and that's i think in in politics it's the worst of it we just assume the worst every idea they have is a bad idea every idea that the other side has is is dangerous and it's and it's a lot of hyperbole and it's just not true too so let's find the truth but it starts with me having coming there with an open mind and mm. and believing that you know, the best of you. 
And, and I, I, I think that's what we need more of in politics. Absolutely. I've noticed in politics that when somebody on the other side does something bad, it almost immediately winds up on a T-shirt. And you get a text saying, you know, send me $25 to get this T-shirt. Yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it, and it's, it's about fueling that, that fire, and about right. dividing us. And it's bad. It's bad for America, and it's bad for democracy, and it's, it's bad for even locally. I mean, we're, mm -hmm. we're neighbors. We need to get along. All right, Pastor. Uh, church environments are certainly free from gossip, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, there's no gossip in a church. Non we call them prayer requests. <laughs> oh, I see. Yeah. And a right? non and let's, an be honest, prayer let's be honest. That's what we do. And that's unspoken, the they used you know, to say. I think it's a search for the truth. I love that that, that came out this morning. I, I'm, I, I was always a fan of, the, of Ronald Reagan's statement, trust but verify. Hmm. And I've, I've encouraged the congregation to be that kind of person. If we're going to speak truth, we need to verify that this is what the truth is and not just get reeled into something. And that's, so if you can't verify it, right, don't right. spread it. That's correct. Uh, someone <clears throat> called me yesterday and said uh, they had gone, the, the shooter, and the, uh, the alleged shooter, um, someone had gone to his Facebook page before they took it down, downloaded every name of every friend. So all day long now they've been investigating every friend, being their own FBI. Mm. And... <clears throat> Just the anxiety, I think, that that causes right, when you're right, inviting that. Right. Stay in your lane, right? right. Don't. All right, let's talk about why young people aren't voting. Why aren't young people going to the polls? Uh, you're a dad. You I have, have young people. Yeah. You I know, have five of them, really. So you've heard a little bit voters. of the cynicism about politics because yeah. they're looking at your business saying, Dad, this isn't real or this is fake or I don't subscribe to what you believe. Why aren't they into politics right now? Well, and, and look, I, I take the blame for it because it's our generation that raised them. But uh, the, the cynicism about politics and, and the media, uh, you know, the, the approval ratings and the trust in the institutions is, is partly our fault mm -hmm. um, because maybe we made it too easy for our kids uh, to have access to so much information where they can't tell the difference between truth and fiction. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, my kids all vote, so I know that. But... Um, you know, this generation is by factors of 10 more concerned about the environment and climate change than any other generation. Mm. And yet, if you look at their behavior, they do more to waste things. There's more plastic bottles, more packaging, mm -hmm. um, less concern about actually my behavior in effect. Personal the responsibility. Yeah. And yeah. so maybe we've eliminated that because we never said no to our kids, mm. where my parents said no mm -hmm. to me every single day, all day long. Yeah. So. Tannen, your kids aren't voting age yet, right? Not yet. Oldest is nine, so we got some time. <laughs> but you're around young people a lot. A lot, a lot of young people volunteer with Wild Heart and, and are uh, very involved in your civic projects yeah. and all that. Uh, what are they saying about politics? Do they see that as the place to make a difference and, and for change to happen? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that perhaps the greatest injustice of, of our time and this generation is just the sheer amount of disillusionment inside of this generation mm -hmm. about all things. Politics is a victim of that as well, but all things. It's just they don't feel like they can trust hardly anything. And I think what makes the work that we do in our community very attractive is it's very hands-on and tangible. I mean, mm. you get to see what you're doing. You get to see the outcome immediately. You don't have to wait four years, right? You don't have to lobby for it. You don't have to yeah. ask if it's going to work. It's like it does. It happens, and you get to see that tangible difference. And I think that it's a, I'd, I'd be curious to know in those statistics, honestly, how much of that drop has happened specifically in battleground states because of we're just inundated with political right. advertising all the time. And I know that for myself, you know, I'm not in the 18 to 29, I'm just past it. It can get exhausting when you feel like your whole life is about making a political decision. Mm -hmm. I think that's why you see an increasing amount of disengagement. It's just like... Mm get away. Like, I'm yeah. done with this. Like, just leave me alone. If I want to vote, I'll vote, which is, it's sad that we're there, but I think, unfortunately, we're actually propagating the problem by continuing to keep the gas on, and young people just don't respond that way. Listen, I want to get into our final question, and uh, that is a statement that raised some eyebrows. We have a lot of Catholic friends, uh, certainly, who watch this program, and um, they're, they're, there's a little bit of concern when the Pope says, look, all roads lead to heaven. And I was listening and rereading those comments thinking, well, maybe he's just making some kind of an opening, an entree to, to build uh, a conversation on climate change or something that he wanted to talk about. But it, it, seemed, it was very specific. It was more than that. Sikh, Hindu, Hindu, Muslim, they all have the equal claim essentially on truth. How do you, Greg, um, take anyone, uh, take this issue? I know it's a tough one, um, but how do you look at this? How do you make room for differences in conversation but at the same time, hold to your convictions. How do you do that? Yeah, well, first of all, you have to know what your convictions are. 
I mean, you have to you have to spend time studying the truth and knowing what the truth is, so you know what your convictions are. And then I look. I think we have a responsibility as believers to share the truth, and so we share with with everyone. But but there's no way I'm ever going to get you to listen to me if I don't engage with you, and mm. I don't engage with you in a, in a spirit of love. And that's mm. uh, I think that's what we try to do. Uh, unfortunately, like that's what we try to do in the private sector when we sell something, right? We right. We, we try to share something that's for the benefit of the person buying right. it. But in politics, we don't do that. We shut down, we try to identify our supporters and then uh, attack the other side. And, mm. and, and that's, I think that, that's why there's so much cynicism, but it ought to be the same way with the most important thing in, in, in your life, which is your salvation. Right. So I should know the truth so I can share the truth. Take 30 seconds on this. Sure, I, um, I haven't had a chance to talk to the Pope about this comment. Yeah. Later this <laughs> afternoon. Maybe later today. Um, here's what I know. Uh, he was probably getting at something that is unique to every faith, and that is that every faith is striving to connect with a with a with God, hmm. no matter what they what terminology they use. The exclusivity aspect to this is that as Christians, we understand that that uh, the position of Jesus in in our salvation, and so and any other faith that that claims to have a connection with God while may have a legitimacy to that connection, doesn't have the same connection that we as Christians have in the person and life and, and sacrifice of Jesus. And that makes us unique in that respect. Very and I think unique. for a Christian yeah. to come out and say, you, you know, every road leads to God, it can be a bit dangerous. Yeah. Um, and, and we can possibly weaken the stance of Christianity in the world. Tanner, you have five seconds to answer this big question. Five seconds. Uh, this is a question that's been since the eight, from the beginning of ages. Who yeah. is Jesus really? And I think that as Christians, we need to choose to believe that he is who he says he is and mm -hmm. don't doubt that. And I think that when you invite that doubt, that's a very dangerous way to have conversations, even if you're trying to build a bridge. Thanks for shedding light. Tough topics this morning, really different, difficult uh, conversation. Well, thanks to our panel for joining us. I'll be back uh, tomorrow. Coming up next... What do you have to offer him? Should we talk about this later? Move out! Well, he plays the Roman centurion Gaius on The Chosen. Deborah sat down with Kirk Waller for a one-on-one -on -one about the show's new season. Good morning our, to our friends in Point Pleasant, independent living in Pittsburgh. You're watching Morning Light on Lighthouse TV. I am the life that overcomes death. I don't understand. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? I believe you are the Christ the Son of God who is coming into the world. So even what I do not understand, I believe. The Chosen is a faith-based TV series that portrays the life of Jesus. Throughout the first four seasons, you see the New Testament brought to life. The finale of season four ended with Holy Week. Filming for season five just finished. I spoke with actor Kirk Waller, who plays Gaius, a Roman centurion, about season five. Can you give us a preview of season five? No, ma'am. I would be in trouble. <laughs> Kurt was hesitant to discuss season five, but eventually gave some insight. Yeah, I, I, I can say this, that it's Holy Week. They are in Jerusalem. And I think we all know what happens during that week and what it's leading to. So it's really, really heating up. Jesus is finally accepted by so many people as being the Messiah. And now there's no question. And so now the forces that exist, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and Rome itself, they've got a problem because there's infighting between the Jews. The, 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 the heads of the Jewish 
church don't believe he's the Messiah. So they got a big problem. And Rome is just trying to manage that issue. So, oh uh, boy, that's what's happening in season five is just a lot of turmoil. And we all know where this is going. <laughs> all it would take is one person to snap and you are. Just do your job. Better hope. Over the past four seasons, Kirk Waller's character Gaius has gone from being a non-believer to supporting Jesus. Overall, it's it's been an amazing ride for, for Gaius. And I will say this, sorry if I, I'm talking too much, but I didn't know any of this at the beginning. Dallas doesn't, I don't know what's going to happen for my character until I sit down and read the scripts for that season. What is What were his thoughts about Jesus starting off to where he is now? It's been a slow journey and, and, and a huge transformation. And Gaius, at this point, he clearly believes in Jesus, that Jesus is from God, clearly. And he had more faith than everyone in Israel, right? That's what Jesus literally says. So, boy, am I walking a tightrope now. So it would be curious to see what happens now that I have taken that step. I'm blowing out the candles. I'm not uh, allegiant, no longer really have allegiance to a pantheon of gods the way the Romans did. I think I'm basically a god for everything. Clearly, Gaius believes in one to the point that he heals his son from afar. So yeah, what's gonna happen now with Gaius? Okay, am I, am I gonna get fired? Am I gonna, what? So yet to be seen, but yes. It's an amazing transformation and, again, such an honor for me to embody that, uh, that character and that journey. It, it's been an amazing journey, for sure. Last year, season four was seen in the movie theater. Kirk told me this was the first time a TV series was premiered on the big screen. Season five is expected to follow suit. I want to say it brought in those episodes like at least $40 million or something, 40, 40, 35, 40 million dollars in box office for a television show about Jesus. Like, no way did that just happen, but it, 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 it did and it does. It is amazing. The first four seasons of The Chosen have been funded by donations. Kirk says ticket sales help to fund more shows. The plan is for seven seasons. All seasons of The Chosen are now available on the official app. The show is also available on all streaming platforms. And coming up next on Morning Light, a central Pennsylvania professor who's been on the set of The Chosen gives us his take on the upcoming season five. And good morning, State College and the Juniper Village at Brookline Senior Living. Thank you for watching Morning Light. Welcome back to Morning Light. We just heard from Kirk Waller about season five and joining me right now is Rob Starner with Cross Lens Ministries. You're a pastor, you're an educator, and you're also an actor. You do it all. A little bit. Why do you like The Chosen? Well, I love The Chosen because it is introducing people to the authentic Jesus that um, sometimes people don't a picture of Jesus they don't normally see in film. Tell us about season five. Kirk was hesitant to talk to us about season five, but then he gave us a little bit of insight. What are your thoughts? Well, season five, if I had to describe it in one word, it's going to be intense. You know, there's a place in uh, season four where Jesus is interacting with the religious leaders and he says, oh, I'm just getting started. Well, in season five, Jesus is beyond getting started. There's going to be a lot more conflict. He's going to be a lot more in the face of the religious leaders, but not in a mean-spirited way, but in an appealing way that they change, they turn, because they are leading the nation astray. So this is very important for Jesus. I think in season five, you're going to see two Rubicon moments. Judas risks it all, and betrays Jesus. 
he gains 30 pieces of silver, but he loses his soul. Right. Jesus, on the other hand, risks it all. He's drawn the line in the sand. He's not turning back. And in the process, he will lose his life. But because of that, billions of people who follow Jesus ever thereafter have their souls saved. So it's a huge difference. Let's talk about the transformation of Gaius. We saw him in season one calling Jesus just a street minister. Mm -hmm. Now to at season four, actually believing that he is the son of God. Talk to us about yeah. that transformation. Well, there's no doubt that he has been impacted. You saw earlier in the scene where Matthew, he looks at Matthew when Jesus calls him and he leaves everything and he's handing him the keys and Gaius is simply going, how do you have everything going for you now? You're going to give it all up? And Matthew says, yes, that impacts Gaius. And the other thing, obviously, is that he hears the message of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, which is about peacemaking and not retaliating in kind when somebody is uh, abusing you or, or such. So that impacts Gaius, and it has made him think. You know, power and force can bend knees that are rebellious, but you'll never melt a person's heart. And Jesus is after our hearts. But the cool thing about it is, when he has our hearts, our knees bow willingly and worshipfully because we recognize him for who he really is. That is really so. a wonderful point, how you, how you draw, drew that all together. Talk to us about it being seen on the big screen. I mean, which is amazing in itself. Oh, yes. I, I think season five is definitely going to be out in the movie theaters first. They'll release it there first. Um, it's great to have the convenience of having the chosen episodes all on your phones, your iPads. And there's also something else about seeing it with a community where you all are getting reactions and you're hearing that. So I think it's going to be powerful. I think it will be first released. And it's good for the company because it will help fund their work. Yes, it is so. amazing. And that's what he did say, that some of the funds will be used to do the next two seasons. So that yes. is really, that is wonderful. Mm -hmm. uh, that it's having such an impact. How has it changed your life? Well, it's interesting you ask that because I've been a Christian since the time I was born, essentially, and I've been a, a professor in Bible colleges and universities. I've studied the Gospels and the, the entire scriptures academically. Uh, I read them devotionally. And you would think, oh, another show about Jesus. What, what's that? Do I have time to fit that in my schedule? But I'm telling you, when I watch the show, I am drawn into the first century. It's like I have a front row seat of everything that's happening. And honestly, I have, I've watched every episode probably four or five times. Wow. And I can tell you, I get emotionally involved and connected in about every episode. Yeah. It's yeah. just that powerful. They Makes get it right. Absolutely, Rob. Thank you so much for being with us. Yes. And stay with us. We will be right back. Coming up tomorrow morning light, he was an accomplished preacher of the great of the first great awakening in Britain and America, drawing audiences of tens of thousands, including Ben Franklin of Philadelphia. We will take you on a faith trail of George Whitfield. Plus, Bible history comes to life at the Creation Museum. We will take you on a family road trip to this attraction near Cincinnati. And that's a look at what's coming up tomorrow on Morning Light. Now, Jeff, your closing thoughts. Well, thank you, Deborah. Well, when I was a young state legislator, I learned if you wanted to be an insider, information rules. Being first to get the rumor made you more valuable. No one in politics wants to be an outsider. That's exactly what social media has become, a respectable way to trot out and test falsehoods and half-truths and lies. The more sensational or juicy, the more you're rewarded with likes and shares. The ultimate reward online? 
going viral. Sounds like the act of spreading an airborne disease, doesn't it? Well, look, the Bible declares gossip, slander, rumors out of bounds, even if the object of that gossip is a politician far away. Here's how the Apostle Paul puts it. Whatever things are true, honest, just, poor, pure, lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Let's try it. With his help, we can. For Deborah and the entire Morning Light team, I'm Jeff Coleman. We'll see you tomorrow.